John 18, now it's going to sound obvious, but what came before John 18? John 17. <laughs> and it's going to be very important for you to remember that as we go through this passage. And what's John 17? John 17 is the prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father uh, and, the, and the disciples were listening. Very, very important. Because this uh, passage now in John 18 begins the process and the uh, events that happened that Jesus eventually got crucified. So I've titled this message, Entering the World of Evil. Jesus entered the world of evil, the world of evil, and we ourselves know that we are in the midst of an evil world. Now, evil doesn't necessarily mean that we have Satan and with uh, all red with a pitchfork and you know killing people. Evil can just be bad things like cancer, like tumors, like uh, you know earthquakes that you know it's just you know volcanoes or what have you that kill people. We live in a world where we know that we are going to be at the risk of, of, of suffering, right? And we have broken homes. And we have people that won't talk to each other in the same family. And uh, very painful. It's a world of evil. And when we look at our own hearts, okay, well, how do we live in a world of evil? Jesus especially is going to enter evil now uh, as we, we read here. So... Um, as we enter evil, we're tempted to do the wrong thing. We're tempted to disobey the Lord. Right? When, when are the temptations strongest? It's temptations for you and for me? Well, temptations come when we are not getting our way. Right? We know what we want and things are not happening the way we want and we're tempted to live in an ungodly way or speak in an ungodly way or take on ethical practices because we're not getting our way, right? Uh, or when we're about to suffer. When we know something is coming and we're about to suffer, we're tempted to force something. Or we're in the midst of suffering, right? That we are tempted to use foul language, make terrible decisions, even though we know they're against the word of God. We know we're against God's will. Uh, and we can look back and say, I remember when I made those terrible decisions. What was I thinking? And, you know, maybe five years ago, 10, 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. And we can say, well, we were ignorant. Perhaps but deep inside, we knew it was wrong, right? We knew it was wrong. So how do we get better? How do we make better decisions to, to enter the world that, or, or, or be a part of this world that we're in, that is evil? Sometimes it's because of our own sinfulness, but it's maybe because of somebody else sinned against us. And how do we deal with that? Um, and... Uh, I say it's not just foul language, but trying to take things into our own hands. It was not trusting God. We're going to do that our, 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 own, our own way. And Jesus says, okay, here's how you enter into the world of evil. And so we see this example of Jesus entering into this world of evil here in this passage. In, a, in an intensified way. He's really, every time, ever since he became a baby, right, that first Christmas. I mean, Herod was already wanting to kill him. I mean, <laughs> it was already evil in the very beginning. But now especially, he's going into the deep evil where they want to crucify him. And he's going to be betrayed. And you, you read the passage, the first 11 verses. And you've got to remember this was after John 17 when he was praying to the Father. So by way of introduction, turn to uh, Matthew 26. 
Matthew 26, which is a parallel passage to John 18. Um, Matthew 26, and starting in verse 31. Uh, this is again, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the garden that he went to. Um, and we begin uh, Matthew 26, starting in verse 31. Then Jesus said to them, to his disciples, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all, my, uh, all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing to him. That is basically the summary of John 14, the last couple of verses of John 14. Peter said, no, I'll, I won't deny you. I'll, I'll, even if I have to die, Jesus said, no, tonight, before the cock crows, Three times you will deny me. So Jesus knew what was going to happen. And so then he proceeds on to verse 36. Then Jesus came uh, with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to grieve, be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell to his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet none, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, this cannot pass away unless I drink it. Your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for the, their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand that the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Jesus knew he was being betrayed. He was on his way to the cross. And he responded the way he did. We come back to our own lives and say, well, how do we respond, for instance, when the truth is being spoken about our shortcomings, our sinfulness? We respond with, the woman you gave me, God. <laughs> we blame other people. The husband you gave me. The situation. If you only knew how I'm being treated. And on and on and on, right? My boss. Oh, if you knew the pain I have over here, that's why I had to cuss. Oh, really? <laughs> we have all kinds of excuses. Well, how do we respond when the truth is being spoken about ourselves? Um, what do we do when we're about to suffer? What do we do when we're about to fall into temptation? Some of us know when the temptation is coming, right? We know when the temptation is coming. What do we do? What does it mean to love in the midst of being attacked? Right? We all know what it means to be attacked. And sometimes to be attacked means from the, the closest around us, our spouse. And our spouse doesn't have to say much. And we bristle. We become defensive. Right? And, uh, oh, if you only knew. No? 
Maybe it's our friends or some business person. They just have to just say one little word and off we go. And we justify it. How, how do we deal with that? You see, this passage, I think, in, in John 18, I think this passage is answering the question, what? What does overcoming the world look like? You see, in John 16, the Gospel of John 16, the last verse of John 16 says what? These things I have spoken to you, so that in me, in me, you may have peace. Notice, where do we get peace? When we have enough money? When we have the right job? When things are working right throughout the day? Oh, I have peace. No. In me, in Jesus, we have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus, what does it mean that you have overcome the world? You see? And I think John 18 answers, begins to answer that question. What does it look like to overcome the world? And we all face the evils of the world. Um, what does it mean in the name of the Father? Because Jesus says in John 17, 6, I, I've made your name known to you, to them. And then in the last verse of John 17, he says, I've made your name known and will make it known. What does that mean? What does that look like? And I think John 18 begins to answer that question. Um, what does it mean to love? Because when things are going right, when we, everything's going right, it's easy to just give in and to buy things and to be gracious and, and smile and everything. But what does it mean to love when you're being attacked, when, when things are not working right? What does it mean? What does it look like? And I think this passage in John 18 answers that question. What does it mean to love in such a situation? Um, you see, we can all say, I love you. But to actually live it out, that's a horse of a different color. <laughs> to actually live out the truth that we're speaking. Man, that's tough. That's real tough. Right? And again, when things are going right, it's easy to love people. Um, all of a sudden, we become very, very ugly when things aren't going the way we want them to go. And Jesus says, here's what it looked like. Look at the way I responded. Look at, look at me. I have overcome the world. You see? So, looking at Jesus in a fresh new way, in the midst of being attacked and betrayed. So, you know, that night, here in John 18, the night was a festive night. They were going to celebrate Passover. And then the night, the, the night before, they start preparing. It's like when we prepare for Thanksgiving or for Christmas, you know, dinner, it doesn't happen Okay, let's better get together and boom, the turkey's done and everything's done, right? No, no, the women and other people get prepared. You know, Christmas, we, we buy gifts and to, to give to one another, to express the love of God towards one another. And there's preparation of all the food and all the, well, that night the, the preparation started because they were going to have the Passover. And it was a national festival. A national party, so to speak. You can imagine. So the night was full of festive preparations, getting ready for the Passover feast. But for Jesus, it was the night of anguish. The night of anguish. He knew he was going to taste sin for the first time in all eternity. He himself was going to become sin so that he could pay for our sins. The rest of the world was going to celebrate. 
That was the night. How would you respond? If you knew everybody was going to be celebrating this next day. And they were all preparing. But you, you were going to be in absolute anguish. How would you respond? How would I respond? The answer is probably not good, <laughs> right? We can be pretty assured that we're not going to respond very well. And so once again, to look at Jesus and to get the context of that night. Everybody else is partying. It's going to be an anguish for him. What, would you, what did we just read from Matthew 26? He went and told the disciples, pray for me. And his, his soul was grieved and, and distressed. In the book of Luke, he tells us that he was so distressed that he sweated blood. Imagine being distressed that much. Wow, that night. That's the context of John 18. We can read it and, oh, okay, Judas, bad boy. Or whatever. But we need to look carefully. At what was, what was the setting. You see. And he had resolved. To do the father's will. Remember. What did he pray? Three times. Father. If there's any other way. That I cannot have to drink this cup. And this cup. We can, we can spend five sermons. And never sound the depth of that cup. Because he was going to take the sins, my sins. All of them. All of them. And place them on himself. All the shame. And guilt. That I have. He was going to put it on himself. And not just mine. Of the whole world. That was a little bit of the cup. The rest of the cup was. Now he was going to take the punishment. Not. The punishment. Of whatever the Supreme Court of the United States says. No the punishment. Of the almighty. Righteous. God. He was going to take the punishment for it all. And everybody else was celebrating. Can you imagine the temptations? To get away from that? To relieve the pain? To relieve the anguish? And we think we have it bad? We think because, I, oh, my wife said this to me. <laughs> I'm going to go crazy. Shut up. <laughs> Be quiet, man. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He had determined that he would do the Father's will. And he knew the suffering that was coming. So when we begin to see Jesus' decisions. As to what did he do as he entered evil. You and I need to be, pay close, close attention. So, the first three verses of John 18, I think Jesus is selecting the place. He's selecting the place where he was going to be betrayed. And he was caring for his disciples. Verses 4 through 9, Jesus faces his enemies. And he faces them with absolute majesty. And sovereignty. And absolute calm. Verses 10 and 11. Jesus safeguards. The father's will. He safeguards the father's will. So we begin. Verses 1 through 3. Jesus is. Selecting the place. And it was after he prayed to the father. In John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, what words? John 17. And it's very instructive to go back whenever you get a chance and see how he prayed. How did Jesus pray? 
Because you and I need to be praying the same way. See, the same content, the same concerns. We get concerns about so many really baseless, superficial garbage compared to what we need to be concerned about. John 17. And so after he had spoken John 17, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kedron where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Notice his disciples are repeated twice in one verse. What's the point? He was caring for them. Even though he knew he was going to be betrayed and tortured and crucified, he was concerned about others, not whether his will was done. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> How different than me. How different than me. When my will is not being done, my wife gets it, my children get it, everybody gets it around me. Nah, not Jesus. I'm going to protect my disciples. Wow, that just floors me right there, you know. And he went forth, it says, to the, he, they crossed the, uh, we were there at the Kidron the Valley, the, and then you go up, there's this, the Mount of Olives, it's called. And from the Mount of Olives, you can oversee Jerusalem. But there was a place there, it was a garden, it says, it's the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus takes them there. Didn't have to go there, right? But he takes them there. He's, he's selecting the place. And the probability is it's a very peaceful place. It's a garden. And the probability is that they could, if need be, maybe run or whatever. It was just outside of town. They had to go down this ravine, this gully, this wadi they call it over there, and go up a little bit, and there was the Garden of, the garden of Gethsemane. So that's where he took them. And he went forth, it says... And it's with his disciples. Now Judas, Judas knew about this place. Judas, the one that was betraying Jesus. And what do we know about Jesus knowing? He, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, right? At the last supper, he said, hey, go do what you need to do. Do it quickly. I know. You're the one. Go. Jesus knows. And so when he says, look at what it says, verse 2, verse two now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. You see, that's the point. Jesus went to a place where Judas knew where they would be. I'm not going to make it hard for you, Judas. I know this is what's happening, but this is the Father's will. And you know where I'm going. Very easy to find me. <laughs> Jesus is selecting the place. So, again in verse 3, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort, and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Uh, the cohorts, the Roman cohorts, that's between 300 to 600 soldiers. <laughs> Think of that. I mean, you know, imagine all of a sudden we, hear, we see 100 soldiers out there. Oh my goodness. Well, there was between 300 and 600 soldiers. What in the world? And they came with weapons. <laughs> and not only that, it said that he came officers from the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees. Uh, the, chief, the officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees means that the Supreme Court officers had come. The highest court of the Jewish nation at that point, even though they were under the Roman rule, they had their own Supreme Court. And that's who they were, the Sanhedrin. So the big shots were coming, along with anywhere between three to 600 soldiers with lanterns and weapons. 
What's up with that? Why? Why? He had been preaching daily in the temple. They had heard his words. But the probability is they had also seen a few miracles from Jesus. And I'm sure that they had heard, man, this guy raised the dead. You know, we might be a little prepared. He might nuke us. <laughs> so you gotta get the, you got you gotta get the sense of what's happening here. These guys were scared, man. And this at night, up a little down a ravine and up the mountain, there's a garden there. Very intense. But they knew where to go. Why? Because Judas knew where. Judas knew. And again he says, there. Verse 3. So the whole first three verses is, Jesus selected the place. So everybody knew where to go because Jesus selected the place. He could have gone to a very different place. He knew that Judas was going to betray him, right? He could have gone to another town, you know, another place. He, he could have hidden. But Jesus is in control, you see. Jesus is in control. And you and I, and he knew he was, he, it was evil. Evil, evil, evil. Dark, dark, dark. And uh, you and I know, if we're honest, we live in an evil world. There's no way around it. We can try to shield our children. We can try to <laughs> name it. There's no way around it. We live in a fallen world. You see? And Jesus says, okay, bring it on. Bring it on. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'll select the place for you. To make it easy for you. Come get me. So he selects, sovereignly selects the place. Calmly, he knows what he's doing. And now in verses 4 through 9, his absolute control is there. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. You remember, everybody's celebrating. He knew he was going to get betrayed, tortured, and crucified. Now you've got three to 600 soldiers with weapons. And it's you and 11 disciples. They're not commandos. They're not rangers. They're fishermen. <laughs> and Jesus is no weapon. Verse 4. So Jesus, knowing, you see that? Circle that baby. <laughs> knowing. All the things that were coming upon him went forth the same exact word that in verse 1. In verse 1 it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth. He took action. He knew exactly what to do. Verse 5, the same exact word. Knowing everything was going to happen to him, he went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? <laughs> he went to face the enemy. Right? And you could say, well, the enemy were ignorant. They were just kind of following, you know, the, 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 the orders of the officers. And the Roman whatever. But then in verse 5, they said... Jesus the Nazarene. I want you to know that the probability in that answer is that there was some arrogance and contempt. Turn to John 1, John 1 and verse 46. John chapter 1 and verse 46. This is when Jesus was first being introduced to the disciples. And... Um, you know, Philip found uh, Nathanael and said to him, We have found uh, him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, 
the son of Joseph. Look at Nathanael's response. What did he say? Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What? Nazareth was looked down upon. I mean, that's the, that's the shanty town. That's where you have drugs and alcohol and prostitution. And Can anything good come out of there? So when the soldier says, Jesus, the Nazarene, yeah, oh man, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> we're the soldiers. We're the elite. We're the officers of the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. We're looking for this scum. <laughs> wow. How would you respond? How would I respond? Man, if I had Jesus' power, who are you looking for? <laughs> Talk to me, baby. Hmm. Nah, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's you and me. That's you and me. Jesus Nazarene. Jesus said, uh, I am. What happened? What happened when he said, I am? It's right there. I'm not making it up. Look at verse 5. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. I remember when the first time I read this, I said, man, that sounds like the three stooges. I am. <laughs> they fell down. <laughs> Couple of things. Number one, when it says that Judas was standing with them, the tense of that verb is something in the past and then something even before that. So the sense is Judas had already been standing along with Jesus' enemies. By the time he got there. And Jesus knew it. Judas had already been plotting. And you and I need to know. That the world will always be plotting. Against God's people. Because they hate God's people. They may not say it. But that's the reality. They might not even know it. But they're working against God's people. And the sense is, when Jesus says, Ego emi, that's what he says in the Greek. I am. What he is signifying is, I am the God of the Old Testament. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the I am. I am the one that parted the Red Sea. I am the one that rules the whole universe. He didn't actually say those words, but that's the meaning. I am. And it was so profound, so deep, they fell back. They didn't know what hit them. And they still didn't know afterwards. Because what happened? They got up again. It's like, <laughs> what happened? Kind of like the three stooges. You know? I mean, it's comical. So, they fell to the ground. Verse 6. Therefore, he asked them again. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll give you a chance. Get up. Get up. You're supposed to take me. Come on, guys, you look like the three stooges. Get up, man. Take me. Who are you, who are you looking at? He had to ask him again. And they're probably ashamed that they even fell down. And they had to regain their own composure and their own pride. Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene, like all macho. 
Jesus said, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way. By having them repeat who they're looking for, now he gave Jesus a chance to say, okay, you repeated it's me, right? So let my disciples go. He was still caring for his disciples. Entering into evil requires that we stay steady and keep loving even when being attacked. It's impossible for me. It's impossible. But we'll get to that. So he says... Uh, let these things, let these go their way. You're not looking for them. And then John, the gospel writer, puts a little commentary there of himself, of, that, that he says. And what does John, the gospel writer, do? He says in verse 9, To fulfill the word which he has spoken of those whom you have given me, I have lost none, not one. He had said that. In John 17. But look at the way he says it. To fulfill the word he had spoken. That is kind of like a formula. That's being used of the Old Testament. The scriptures. That the word of God may be fulfilled. What is John the gospel writer doing? He's equating Jesus' word. With the word of God. Because that's exactly what he is. What it is. Jesus' word is the word of God. And when God says something, it, that's the way it's going to be. So John is saying, huh, this Jesus was being betrayed. He's in absolute control and his word is divine. Do his word. Obey his word. We don't. In fact, what do we do? We do the next verse. Because the next verse tells us what Peter did. Right? And Peter represents all of us, I'm afraid. He took things into his own hands. In fact, he even used violence. And we use violence. It might be not a 45 or even a 22, but we use violence with our words. We use violence with our attitude. We use violence with our condemnation of others. We are put downs of others, and we violate their character. Peter did what reveals about all of us. Verse 10, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. That's what we normally do, right? We're going to make it happen ourselves. We do all, have all kinds of resources. And if violence doesn't do it, then we withdraw. I'm not going to be a part of the church. I'm not going to be a part of this family. I'm not going to be a part of this group. I'm going to cut relationship. We were just puny little things walking around threatening, right? Uh, but we try to control. Peter tried to control. And you see, what happens when we, when we do that? We step out of God's will. And then we complain that life is not working. <laughs> because we're stepping out of God's will. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into its sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, this is God's will that I suffer and pay for everybody's sins. You think that you're going to keep me from obeying my Father? My Father's will is inviolable. It's going to happen, Peter. Uh, you cannot stop it. It's God's will. You know, uh, 
And we need to remember in all of our life, God's will is going to be done. God's will is going to be done. Peter, you, you think I'm not going to obey my father's will? By you doing violence? Is that your system? Doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work. The suffering and the punishment and taking on this vial, that's, that's my cup. That's my cup. I want to obey my father and you're, you cannot stop that. Um, in the Old Testament, the cup, often association, it has an association with suffering and the wrath of God. Usually the cup in the Old Testament has to do with suffering and the wrath of God. Let me just give you some scriptures. You can look it up yourself later. Psalm 75 verse 8. Psalm 75 verse 8. Isaiah 51 verse 17. Isaiah 51 verse 17. And verse 22 of Isaiah 51. Jeremiah 25 15. And in the New Testament. Revelation 14 verses 9 and 10. The cup of the wrath of God. Revelation 16 and verse 19. So when I say that the cup was Jesus' taking on of sin and the wrath of God, there's solid biblical foundation that that's what it is. So how do we apply this? Because you see, what we have is that Jesus was determined to keep the will of the Father. He was determined to keep the will of the Father. And the will of the Father cannot be forced or violated. It's going to happen. Right, it's going to happen. So, you know, how do we live out that truth? Um, well, first of all, in verse 10, we find Peter taking things into his own hands, right? And there's where the temptation is going to come, and we must not take things into our own hands, but follow God's will. Follow God's will. So, okay, you're working in a company, and things are being done unethically. And you're being frustrated, and it's political, and you're getting the short end of the stick, and you're getting the raw deal, and things are not, you know, you know what are you going to do? What's God's will? God's will is for you to act ethically, morally, uprightly, to do things right, even if people do not like it, even if you lose money. Don't take things into your own hands. Um, how many times have I seen families be broken apart because they want to do their will and they don't care about God's reputation, God's will to act in love and honorably? No. My will is not being done. So I'm going to pout, I'm going to I'm going to punch, I'm going to scream, I'm going to cuss, I'm going to do whatever it takes because my will. No. No. Not taking things in their own hands, but following God's will to live moral, ethical, upright lives. Loving lives. Now, how do we do this? <laughs> because I've already said it's impossible for me to do it. I can guarantee you, if we walk out of here and you put me down, you're going to get a piece of me. Sadly. That's just a normal knee-jerk reaction. But as, as a knee-jerk reaction, it's sinful. It's sinful. So how in the world can you and I prepare for that and, 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 and begin to act more like Jesus? Well... John 18. What comes before John 18? John 17. What happened in John 17? Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. What did he tell them in the Garden of Gethsemane? When he told them, come watch with me. Pray so that you will not fall into temptation. So that's it. We need to pray for strength not to fall into those temptations. Because sometimes many of us already know what's coming. 
We already know the words that are going to be said. We already know when our buttons are going to be punched, right? <laughs> and we're not prepared because we haven't spent time with the Lord. We haven't said, Lord, I, I know I'm going to be offered weed. I know I'm going to be offered pornography. I know there's going to be bad jokes that are going to come. I already know that they're, they're going to offer me something that's not right. And we don't pray. We go in our own strength. I want to say no. I want to say no. I want to say no. <laughs> and by that, boom, we give in. We don't spend time saying, God, I need your mercy and your grace, your help. God, help me focus on your will, not my reputation. Your will. You know, as a father, many times I've caught myself. Well, I'm the father of this house. You're not going to obey my voice? Man! <laughs> it's like, like, what is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not thinking about the, the glory of God. I'm not talking about representing Jesus. I'm not even thinking about Jesus. It's about my pride. Well, Reuben, be quiet. It's not about you. It's about obeying the will of my Father. And I need prayer. God, help me. Help me, God. And it's a constant need to pray. That's what Jesus' words. Pray that you may not fall into temptation. Right? Jesus, the whole chapter, all of chapter 17, is Jesus talking to the Father. And the very first thing that he says in the prayer is what? God, Father, this connection between you and me, I gotta have. Father, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the sins of the whole world. Then I'm going to take your wrath. I need this connection with you like never before, Father. Glorify me with the glory I had before the foundation of the world. I need it. So that then I can go through this and give life to others. And that's what happened, brothers and sisters. When we have connection with the Father, we're going to be able to suffer. But we're going to suffer in such a way that it's going to give life to others. It's going to give grace and mercy and patience to others. Not a condemnation, a rejection, a judgment. You're no good. You're doing what is wrong. No. We're going to hurt, but they're going to receive grace. You see, grace. Like Jesus showed in love to his disciples. But we gotta have that ongoing connection with the Father. So application number one, don't take things into your own hands. Keep acting ethically, morally. Application number two, stay connected with the Father. Pray, 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 ask for help. And to show you your own sinfulness, your own limitations, ask the Father. And then finally, we gotta look to Jesus, right? We got to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Jesus is the one that acted perfectly. We look to him as our example. You see? Because if we look to each other, forget it, man. Forget it. We need to look to Jesus. Last passage, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And then we'll see about any questions or comments that you may have. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, which is all of chapter 11 of Hebrews, uh, believers trusting in God, um, surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes. How are we going to run this race? How are we going to run this race in this fallen world? And I am fallen. How? Verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. 
the joy that other people are going to come to follow the Lord, going to come to know Jesus, is how I allow, allow myself to suffer for Jesus, leading them to the truth. You see, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Look to Jesus as the example. That's why it's very important to go back to the Gospels, right? Go back. How did Jesus respond? What did he rely on? What did he say? What did he value? What got him mad? How did he, what, what made him rejoice? What makes all of heaven rejoice? See, our values and everything is getting readjusted. There needs readjustment. Because our values are all messed up. We need to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we look to passages like John 18 to see how he responded as he entered evil. But it's those choices that we have to make. You and I have to make that choice every day, every moment. That we're going to look to Jesus. Will you make that choice? Will you? So let my life be the proof, the proof of